Good evening, everybody. I'm Terry McCarthy. I'm the new president of the American Academy. Delighted you all to join us tonight um, for our action-packed panel on action in the Balkans. Um, let me just uh, recognize a couple of people in the audience. Um, Evgenia Siderias from the U.S. Embassy. You're very welcome. We have two ambassadors, Ambassador Kornblum, Ambassador von Richthofen. You're very welcome. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, our moderator tonight is another ambassador, former ambassador, Ambassador Ischinger. And I'm going to hand her over to him uh, without any more ado um, and uh, look forward to the discussion. And then afterwards, we'll have some questions and we'll have a microphone going around the hall. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Terry. Uh, let me first say that as a member of the board of the Academy, we are really, and I, I think I can speak on behalf of the entire board, we are really proud to have you, Terry. We needed a new president. And we're so... <laughs> That's right. And we're really proud to have you. So w welcome again. This is a an impressive crowd for a subject that is not uh, not everybody's favorite subject, and I'm really uh, delighted to have such a wonderful group here. Uh, before I introduce the panel and, uh, and and we get started, let me just, by way of introduction, offer one one thought. When we had a discussion, uh, John Kornblum, of course, is also a, a veteran, both of this academy and of the Balkan exercise that we've been involved for the last 20 or more years, <clears throat> when we had a discussion about what should be the agenda items for the Academy uh, after uh, Richard Holbrook passed away a couple of years ago, <clears throat> I belonged to those who said, well, we should at least try to put Richard's most important legacy in some way on the agenda, uh, uh, now and then. Uh, the Balkans, Bosnia, D Dayton, Kosovo, uh, etc. And I'm delighted that that has actually worked out. This is not the first, and I'm, I hope certainly not the last event here at the American Academy dealing with what, in my view, is the one important, unsettled, unresolved uh, regional problem zone in greater Europe. I mean, there are a couple of other regions that have problems, but this is our backyard. Uh, that was recognized a long time ago, but we have, as Europeans, we have not been <clears throat> uh, very well equipped to deal with it. And we need it way back in the mid-90s, we needed uh, impressive and strong American help and support and military power to start dealing with the Bosnian <coughs> massacres. And we have tended to need American leadership, including and in particular by Richard, by, by our friend Dick Holbrook and, and others in, uh, in succeeding years. So this is and remains a very, very important issue for those of us who believe that the European Union should actually begin to think that it should equip itself with the uh, means, the capacity, the decision-making apparatus to deal with these remaining potential and real conflict zones in our own backyard. We're not quite there yet, which is why it's great that we have continued American interest. I'm not sure to what extent that American interest extends to the current Trump administration, but I'm sure we'll talk about that also uh, tonight. <clears throat> now, before I turn to the panel, let me just remark that I see a number of people in the audience who, uh, um, uh, of course, I mentioned John Conlow already, but there's also General Carter here, I see, who uh, played an important role in leading twice, uh, uh, you know, the K4 military effort in uh, uh, in Kosovo. So I'm sure he has a story, an important story to tell. The panel, I'm proud to say, is a panel of great friends of mine. I start to my immediate left with my friend Frank Wisner, 
those who uh, those of you who have uh, spent time thinking about and dealing with uh, uh, Balkan issues, in particular Kosovo, will remember that Frank Wisner uh, was the front man um, a decade ago on behalf of the U.S. Uh, government in dealing with the unresolved uh, uh, attempt to bring the Atisari plan to fruition and get it adopted by the Security Council in the spring of 2007 that failed. And then the two of us found ourselves <clears throat> uh, as companions yes. in what ended up being called the Troika effort in the second half of 2007. So I, w I just want to thank you very much, Frank. You. you were a great uh, advisor, mentor, colleague, and friend in this joint effort. Cameron Munter, to his uh, left, is one of those American diplomats who have somehow managed to be dispatched to the hard places. <laughs> he, he served as ambassador to a place called Pakistan, yes. which is probably not everybody's favorite <laughs> vacation spot. Uh, he served as ambassador also at a at, at not so easy period of time in Serbia, in Belgrade. So he has his own vast uh, 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 you know, trove of, uh, of, of background, of experience with don't, the region. Don't forget Bonn. That was the tough one. <laughs> and Bonn, which, which from, seen from Berlin, is part of the Balkans. <laughs> and then, last not least, Jonathan Levitsky, who served during the if I can call this the Holbrook mission, as one of the key advisors and architects of such uh, things as Resolution 1244, for those of us who were involved in that, that was an important step to bring the Russians back into, um, uh, into the fold uh, in June of 99, uh, after the <coughs> military intervention in Kosovo. I'm going to hand over to you, Frank, to present uh, the views that you and the group has elaborated. I just want to say that from our, certainly from my personal point of view, I can only speak on my own behalf, it's extremely important that we continue to get the message that the United States is not forgetting Europe and is not forgetting Southeastern Europe and is not forgetting the Western Balkans with these unresolved conflicts. Speaking of Macedonia and Greece, speaking of Serbia and Kosovo, speaking of land swaps, speaking of uh, fragmentation uh, potentials in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, more problems than we like to have. Uh, it's important that we get the signal that you guys continue to be engaged and involved. That is essential. Finally, I want to say that I am proud to see that the German government has, in a way, taken the lead in recent years, trying to revive European interest by starting what is now called the Berlin process, uh, bringing leaders from the region uh, to Berlin, and that process has now led to a sequence of su su uh, subsequent annual meetings, which I think have at least had some some created some lasting impression yes. on the leaders who now know that we've not started to forget them and their problems. So welcome again to all of you. Uh, we will now have a presentation by F Frank and his uh, team members, and then we'll, uh, uh, as quickly as possible, open this to your questions and comments. Ambassador Wisner. Well, Wolfgang, first of all, let me thank you very much for the hospitality of the house. Um, this is not the first, but in fact the second time that you and I have been together to talk about the Western Balkans in this very room. Right. Um, and I welcome the word that you give tonight that it's one of the enduring issues that needs to remain in the forefront of discussion and thinking, particularly in this very difficult period <clears throat> we're going through right now with so many other issues crowding the international agenda that it's complex 
at best, to say complex, for European leaders and Americans to focus on the imperatives of the Western Balkans. But I also wanted to say thank you for mentioning Richard Holbrook. Um, this academy exists in large part because of his dream, his vision. Um, and as I sit here tonight, I can literally hear him hollering in my ear, you better take that Kosovo job. <laughs> and when you're at it, do something about Bosnia at the same time. Uh, John Levitsky had those same ears, his ears pounded many times when you had your laptop out and you were trying to draft the Rambouillet Agreement. Um, as Cameron is remembered, uh, Dick Holbrook, he was an extraordinary figure. And we meet to keep attention on subjects that w he knew were vital to the future of American security for the future of Europe. I also wanted to add my own word of congratulations, Terry, to you on your uh, new preferment and to wish you very well, not only from the three of us, but from the many admirers of the Academy in the United States. We're glad you've come to take this over and give it your expertise and leadership, and we wish you well. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful innings for you, and we all... Uh, join in hoping that it's rewarding for you as it will be for all of us. So that brings me back, Wolfgang, to the subject that we have to discuss this evening, and I hope that the three of us, when we finish, will find en enough in common with all of you in the audience to have a good exchange and come up with ideas. I know I can count on John Kornblum to have more than one skeptical question. Um, the basic starting point that brought the three of us together and several others who are not here for various reasons this evening was the conviction in twofold. First, that the United States was ignoring the Western Balkans to its peril. And second, that 2018 appeared to be opening up some fresh prospects. Um, both points, I continue after now more than a year of hard work to believe, were true statements, though they haven't reached the outcomes that optimistically we might like to have thought possible. But we believed at the outset that it was worth all of us setting aside serious time in our lives to think not about the Balkans, its history, its sociology, its economics, but to think about policy. What should motivate and guide American policy in particular, and how the United States and Europe should work together? And we came out with, and have published this spring, a piece of paper uh, that the Academy is happy to make available to anyone who wishes to read it, Time for Action in the Western Balkans. The Time for Action was directed primarily, and I want to underscore it again, at American readers and American audiences. Because we argue, as our first premise, that the United States has a vital stake in the security of Europe. It has undergirded as one of the great principles of American foreign policy since World War II and even before, and that without a Europe that is whole, a Europe that is free, a Europe that is at peace with itself, our job for Europe is not done. We recognized in this work that we undertook that the responsibility for the future of the Western Balkans lay heavily with Europe. It's a primarily a European responsibility. But politically, the United States has a vital stake in it. And in security terms, since the Western Balkans is part of the remit of NATO, it's a direct American security issue as well. And those two powering points, but a clear recognition that the leadership 
for finding a way forward in the Western Balkans needed to lie in Europe, needs to lie in European hands, but with solid cooperation from the United States. And if we came to the table to address that issue, we came to the table because we began to believe during the latter, the course of the Obama administration and now the Trump administration, Americans diverted by other crises around the world had taken their eye off the ball. So here we are tonight to try to argue in favor of putting our eye back on it and rebuilding that partnership with Europe that we think is important to ensure Europe's success. Now, when we took, sat down and looked at the region, we looked over the past 10 years since Kosovo became independent. <clears throat> and we came to four conclusions which disturbed us and reminded us that work <clears throat> needs to be done. The first conclusion, if you look back over these 10 years, is that in no instance is any Balkan nation better governed today than it was 10 years ago. In fact, the same elites uh, and with the same habits remain firmly entrenched in the region. Governance in the Western Balkans is notor notoriously bad, and it is not significantly in any manner getting better. Second, during the course of this past decade, we have seen a rise in tensions of a variety of sorts. Tensions inside of societies, Bosnia being a classic case, between countries, uh, between Kosovo and Serbia. We've seen tensions of an ethnic and religious nature rise in the region. We've seen more disillusion uh, disassembly of the region internally than we would have liked to have thought would have been the result of the hard effort Europe and the United States put into ending the crisis in Yugoslavia during the 1990s. The third conclusion we reached was over these past 10 years we've begun to see a serious intrusion of very unhelpful external elements notably the Russians, who still miffed by the fact that they lost out in their minds. They lost influence in the region in the outcomes in Bosnia, the outcome in Kosovo, have played a spoiler role throughout the region through not the expenditure of large sums of money, but political interference, intelligence interference, radio propaganda interference, working through institutions like the Orthodox Church, never with a vision to build a better and stronger Balkans, but how to bedevil <clears throat> Europe, the United States, and stability, forcing all of us to make Russia a player, force us to take Russian interests into primary account, even though Russia had very little to put on that table. Russia is not alone. Uh, we've seen the rise of fundamentalism. There were uncommon numbers of people from the area who took off for Syria. Uh, there were incidents. There have been many arrested. Uh, <coughs> religious fundamentalism first began to appear in this last decade. Third, China. China's role at this stage is more ambiguous, but the Chinese have committed 10 billion euros to the construction of Belt and Road projects in the Balkans, and in the absence of other forms of capital, this is really welcome. Uh, China today is not playing a political card, but in terms of where Chinese overall policy is going, we can be certain that a minimum that will happen is the standards and terms of doing business in Europe will be undercut by the Chinese in the way they spend their money in the Balkans. The fourth and perhaps our most serious conclusion about this last decade is that the region itself had, has begun to lose confidence 
in the trajectory that we believed would bring the region forward into the Euro-Atlantic community. That is, eventual membership in the European Union, eventual membership in NATO. That while there have been many useful undertakings, and I will be the last, and my colleagues too, to make light of the Berlin process, of what happened at Saloniki, what's happened in the numbers of meetings that preceded Sofia this year, by serious commitments and the expenditure of large sums of money and effort, there is still there is even less confidence in the region today that one day the Balkans will be part of Europe. There are some exceptions to that. Uh, the Croatians are in, and you've seen Macedonia and Albania offered uh, a path to the future. But generally speaking, confidence in that future has diminished. So we then turned our minds to, what do you do about this? If uh, that's a description of the problem, the challenge we faced, we believe the first step is to reform an American and European association behind a commitment of Europe to carry forward in the Balkans and aim to bring the matter to a conclusion. We didn't pretend that you're going to settle all the problems in the Balkans in the next couple of years, but that it fell to you and your imagination to create a credible path that would get the nations of the Balkans to a European outcome. A credible path. That last point that I mentioned hitherto for, in which Balkan, Balkan peoples have lost confidence, a credible path. For what are we watching? We're watching throughout the Balkans today the flight of young people, particularly educated young people, seeing corruption in their society's lack of opportunity, are packing their suitcases and moving on to the rest of to Europe itself because they don't see a credible path to the improvement of their own societies and their eventual incorporation <coughs> into the greater Europe. So a credible path means, and we try to articulate it, a number of steps. They're tough. Some require very important reforms <coughs> in Balkan nations. Others, ideas that will make it clear where Europe is headed. Ways of dealing with trade, ways of dealing with currency, ways of dealing with infrastructure construction that will make it clear there are benefits for sacrifice. Because we're very clear, you've got to be able to make progress based on Balkan peoples reforming themselves. It's not all about gifts that come from Brussels, from NATO, or from uh, the European Union. <coughs> now, we ran up against immediately several pressing problems. And I'm going to ask my colleagues to join me and talk about those problems to bring down our conclusions to rather practical subjects. So I thought if we could, because I am particularly concerned about the fragility of it, John Levitsky, if you wouldn't mind starting and talking a bit about Bosnia. I'd be happy to do it, and, and uh, thank you uh, uh, all for hosting us this evening. It's, it's such an honor for me to be here uh, personally. Ambassador Holbrook was a, was a, a mentor and, and dear friend, uh, and being here at this place that he spoke about so often is an extraordinary reminder both of his legacy and also of his personal capacity to just get stuff done. It's amazing how much stuff he got done, and this is uh, uh, an extraordinary example of it. Um, so. Uh, just to, by way of coming into this topic, let me give a, a little bit more personal history. I, I worked with Richard in the late 1990s and, and the early part of, of the 2000s on uh, first the Kosovo peace process, the Rombway Agreement, Resolution 1244, and then peace implementation in the Balkans. And, and then I left the government. I was a political appointee. I became a lawyer in private practice uh, and spent many, many years doing what I still do, large, complex corporate transactions, uh, having nothing whatsoever to do with the Balkans. Occasionally, I'm called in to consult about things, but that's about it. 
And uh, when Ambassador uh, Wisner called and asked if I would rejoin the, this, uh, this, this bandwagon and, and reimmerse myself in the issues, I was delighted to have the opportunity to do it. I was a little concerned that it would be hard to get up to speed. Uh, and I found, to my shock and horror, that it wasn't hard to get up to speed at all because nothing had changed. Uh, uh, not only were the issues the same uh, in, in pretty much every country in the region, with some slight evolution, and, and in some cases particularly uh, the important work that Ambassador Ischinger and, uh, and Ambassador Wisner did with respect to Kosovo, some very favorable developments. But nonetheless, by and large, very much the same issues and, and the same players, literally the same players, all the same people I had worked with closely who I knew, who I had relationships with, they were all still in their, job, in their jobs, unless they died. That, that was the only way that you left a role. Um, so, and then they were often replaced by their children. Uh, and, so... It wasn't too difficult to get up to speed. Um, it was a static situation. Uh, and yet, at least from the perspective of the United States, and perhaps less so from Europe, there was a tendency, and there is a tendency, I think, to mistake that stasis for stability. Uh, but the stasis is not stability. In fact, it's a highly unstable situation, and I think becoming increasingly more so, particularly in Bosnia. And let's talk about why and then what we might do about it. So there are two things, really, that are driving the instability in Bosnia. The first is the sort of uh, a gradual exit of the United States uh, from, from the country and, and from focus on the, on the country. Our role as a guarantor of the Dayton Accords, uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as a force to uh, hold the parties to their commitments, was a profoundly important one. And as it slipped away uh, from the 9-11 period forward, uh, so too went much of the Western powers leverage uh, in the in the country, and the second thing, uh, equally important, maybe I think frankly more important, is the point that Ambassador Wisner raised: um, the the driving force, the thing that had really motivated the parties to action, always not just in Bosnia but throughout the region, was the prospect that if they just did the right things, if they behaved in the ways that we were asking them to behave, if they reformed their institutions in the way we were asking them to reform them, they would one day aspire to European Union membership. And that was, for many years, a realistic prospect. People believed that that was something that could happen. Uh, increasingly, uh, I think leaders in the region don't believe that that's a real prospect. Or if they believe that the carrot of European Union membership is real, they believe that it's so far on the distant horizon that it's not real for them from a political point of view. It's not going to happen during their political lifetime. And so even if the carrot looks fabulous on the horizon and it looks delicious to eat, they don't think they're ever going to get to eat it. Uh, and that motivates behavior, it changes behavior in very profound ways. Um, at the same time, the, the, the institutions that Richard set up in, 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 in Bosnia, which were intended to be a, a peace settlement, really, they were not intended to be the end state for a fully functioning country, uh, those institutions uh, failed to evolve, in part because of the lack of focus from uh, Western powers in the region. And, and those institutions became a way of ossifying uh, power among ethnic groups, uh, uh, often uh, power that unfortunately had ties to organized criminality uh, and corruption. Uh, and, and that combination created, in, fu in a funny way, a cozy form of ethnic cooperation in which groups that were in a public way at each other's throats were actually rather happy with the status quo and enjoyed dividing up the spoils of the nation. Uh, and at the same time, as all of these things occurred, outside influences began to rear their head, uh, as Ambassador Wisner described, and, and we can talk more about that later. But those are, that's the big picture in Bosnia. Let's talk about the near-term crises. Uh, and they all relate to uh, the election and, and, um, and the election law. So Bosnia has a series of sort of messed up issues in its constitutional situation. Uh, one of them is that in the last year or so, the Bosnian Constitutional Court held that the electoral law was unconstitutional. And they held elections just recently without an electoral law in place. Uh, those elections' have, uh, results are still being tabulated, but they're basically known. And uh, the problem with having an election without an electoral law is that you can't actually seat a government. And because of the rather Byzantine institutional <laughs> arrangements that exist within the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, the, the absence of an election law sort of tears through the system and ultimately gets to a place, you to a place where you won't have a national government either, as well as a, uh, a government within the, the Bosnia and Herzegovina Federation. Um, why does that matter, uh, given how poorly Bosnia is governed as it is? 
uh, because at a certain point, you actually do need governments to do things like adopt budgets and pay pensions uh, and salaries. salaries. The place is going to run out of money. Uh, so at some point before the new year, <laughs> this issue has to be resolved. Uh, and it's a microcosm for all of the tensions in Bosnian society. And we're seeing uh, uh, all manner of bad action by various political players on the ground as they dispute these electoral results within the context of the fight about the election <laughs> law and fight to jockey for power at a moment when, unfortunately, I think not enough attention, attention is being paid to the real risk that this jockeying could result in a rather dangerous outcome, even violence of the sort that we saw in the late, teen, late 1990s that required the United States to, to, to bring its attention, its full attention to bear. And part of our message to American policymakers is that the time now it has come to make a small investment in order to avoid half the, the potential, the very real potential risk of having to make quite a large investment again uh, in the not very distant uh, uh, future. Uh, we talk in our report about things that the United States can do in order to assert its influence. Uh, we also talk about things that, um, that our colleagues in, in the European Union can do. And the most important conclusion we come to in that regard is that in order to overcome this sense that the carrot isn't real, we need, in addition to very firm conditionality, so it's clear what it is we want the people in Bosnia, yes. in, in Bosnia to do, yes. and that is concrete and achievable so that you can sort of see that it's not uh, purely abstract, but that in addition, there are things that people will get within their political lifetime that seem worthwhile. And in addition, we need to have uh, on the table all of the, carrot, all of the sticks that, that, that we have. Uh, the bond powers, which are severely denuded in, ter in terms of their credibility, uh, as well as other kinds of things like sanctions in the way that we went after uh, Mr. Dodik uh, last year in the United States. So that gives you a little bit of a flavor of, of our, our views on Bosnia. It's a, um, it's a rather serious situation and one that, at least in the United States, is not getting the attention that it, that it ought to be. And, and our, our mission as a group has been to try and uh, raise that profile to the extent we can. Wolfgang, uh when you and I left Kosovo 10 years ago, plus a bit, I think we would have liked to have thought that the finality of independence for Kosovo would change the profile of the Serbian relationship with that place and indeed with the rest of the, of the Balkans. Uh, I'm sad to say that as deeply embedded in the mind of Serbia and in the mind of Kosovar Albanians, as is the issue of Kosovo, it really hasn't changed very much. But we have seen countless efforts to try to bring Serbia and Kosovo together, to find a way to, for the pair of them to live in respect for one another and for Kosovo to get on with its life as an independent country, join the United Nations and other international institutions. No one has worked harder, no body has worked harder for this outcome than has the European Union. And I followed very closely the work of Mrs. Ashton, who achieved agreement after agreement, seemingly small, would there be representation in each other's office, could you open customs uh, exchange so that goods could flow somewhat easier? But still the hardcore reality has remained. The two countries are seriously estranged. Along has come uh, President of Serbia, and I'm going to ask Cameron to say a bit more as he knows him well, who has come up with an idea, a tiebreaker, to try to get this issue off of dead center. And that is to work out some form of territorial exchange in which the northern sliver of Kosovo would revert to Serbia and villages in the Preševo Valley in southeastern Serbia would become part of Kosovo. And in that territorial deal, uh, the Serbs would find adequate reason to say enough, and perhaps then Kosovo could move on. The idea that Vucic put on the table has instant appeal. 
all of us would like to see this problem settled. It is enormously attractive to think you could design a territorial settlement that would have such powerful political consequences. And so all of us can imagine, let's take a magic wand and swipe it over the region. But there is a whole series of problems that accompany any notion like a territorial exchange. And I believe that they've been heavily covered in the press, but in brief, we have adequate reason to worry that you start jiggering ethnic groups and moving them across borders and you let Pandora's box open up in the rest of the region and outside of the region as far as Ukraine and other ethnic, pet up ethnic difficulties inside of Europe. You start rewriting borders, you reap a whirlwind. That's a pretty powerful argument. Uh, whether it's totally convincing or not, I leave to anyone who wants to debate it. There is also another very real reason, and that is the depth of sentiment inside of the two governments. How are they actually going to make something like this work? Which villages? What about the Serbs who are left behind? The Albanians who are caught up in the switch of territories? Where do you draw these borderlines? What do you do with water and mines and other complex matters? But I think we've also come up with an, another issue to really be concerned about, and that is the emotional one that's rooted in the culture and history of the region. And that is a sense that any compromise, the other man wins and you lose. And Kosovars in particular hold very deeply to the view that if territory goes to Serbia, Serbia wins, and the long vision of Albanian nationalism, Kosovar nationalism, loses. And you can anticipate, I think realistically, despite the presence of NATO forces, violent opposition. Certainly, the Albanian political class in Kosovo is hopelessly divided, and so our report we decided after we looked and thought about this matter that it's an idea with many attractive features, but its time hasn't come. Instead, the job returns to Brussels to sit down and go through chapter by chapter the differences between the two countries, to outline those differences to do the analysis, to provoke the negotiations, to link the outcome to eventual membership in the EU, and start the hard work of building brick by brick. I think that's the only way forward. And it's going to be painful and slow, but it's the only prospect I see. Now, <coughs> if that <coughs> isn't enough to discourage all of you, let me enter a note of some hope. We've seen many bad things going on in the region. <clears throat> Not everything went badly this year, but what has gone right is still tentative. Cameron, would you talk for a moment about the issues in Macedonia? I will, and before I do, let me have the advantage of hearing other people talk, others who are wiser than I am, and to kibitz on each of their, their uh, uh, statements. First of all, uh, I would make it clear, at least in our opinion, I think it's clear, it is uh, by orders of magnitude the danger in Bosnia, the danger of Bosnia being the thing that could be the problem that, as Jonathan mentioned, could lead to violence, is much greater than these other problems, Macedonia, yes. Kosovo. So these are not simply three problems <coughs> that we're putting in front of you to talk about, the kind of good problem, <coughs> Macedonia, Greece, the kind of difficult problem, <coughs> Serbia, Kosovo, and the kind of more difficult problem. They are not of the same type. Bosnia is the main one. Bosnia is the immediate one. Bosnia is the urgent one. I, th I think we have c consistency on that. Secondly, on the questions of how uh, we wrestled with the issue of uh, the, uh, the uh, prospect of a vucic thaci deal uh, uh, for Serbia and for Kosovo, the attraction, of course, is... You can make this into a frozen conflict. You can always find reasons not to do things. 
for some people and for myself. You know, there was this question, what happens if you actually try something? Can it shoot things forward? Can it be an attractive notion to break the gridlock that we've seen? Here's Jonathan saying he comes back after 20 years and nothing has changed. This would be something that changed. And I think the strongest answer to that in Serbia, Kosovo, that Frank alluded to, is you will get short-term advantage, no doubt. If Thaci were to be able, which I don't think he can, to deliver a Kosovar uh, public and, and political class to an agreement, if Vucic could do that, he can. Vucic can, agree, can deliver for the Serbs. And if Mogherini is able to say, I brought together the Europeans to show we can do something, what I suspect is, deep down, each of them is looking for that immediate, that immediate step that makes Vucic look like a peacemaker, makes Tachi look like a peacemaker, makes Mogherini look like a peacemaker. But the issues that are hard are the issues that this doesn't solve. The issues of rule of law, the issues of press freedom, the issues of the structures, we call it the infrastructure, not so much the infrastructure of the roads and the pipelines, but the infrastructure of democracy which is not built, you're not going to build that infrastructure by making this deal. And I think that's the point Frank is making, that the grinding work of trying to do that takes attention and takes commitment. It's much less sexy than the idea of snap, making a deal. But it's what we have to do. And whether or not we can do that, we're not trying to say we're sure the Americans are there to support, and we're not sure that the Europeans have their act together. And we're not sure that the individual components, the Germans in the lead, have either the energy or the interest to do it. But there doesn't seem to me to be another alternative. Turning to Macedonia, it's actually the nicest of the stories. Because here are people, uh, the leadership, you know, Zayev in Macedonia and Tsipras in Greece, who have shown real statesmanship, who've led an effort that is unpopular in both countries among certain constituencies to try to really uh, solve a problem. And I give a lot of credit to Tsipras, who has matured uh, according to his foreign minister with whom I spoke a couple of weeks ago. But I think fairly to say he has, he has matured into someone who is trying to figure out how the region can become more, uh, more closely integrated into Europe. And Zayev, with his reformist government, is making the same kind of effort. Now, it's a very complex problem that has happened. Those of you who follow this know that there has been a referendum that took place the referendum required, uh, in, in support of the name change of northern Macedonia, it required a 50% participation. And this is a very difficult problem because the voter rolls, uh, there, there haven't been uh, censuses in any who knows how long. And a number of people who live out of the country were not able to vote. So the deck was stacked against that 50% requirement of participation uh, even before the vote came. And indeed, they only got 30%. But it was an overwhelming vote. 90% of those who voted voted for the name change. Okay, so it's not a, legitimate, uh, a legitimizing step. But Zayev is trying to make it into that. He is engaged in a process which could go on for months in his parliament of going into constitutional changes that would allow a vote, two-thirds vote of the parliament, that could allow this change, uh, name change and then throw it back into the court of the Greeks. This is not a sure thing. Those of us who watched the way that the government dealt with it, the, the Macedonian <clears throat> government dealt with this, were sometimes horrified at how, how easily they pocketed the agreement that was signed by leaders and assumed we've done it, and they haven't. So it could happen. We're hoping it happens. And it will take the defection or the uh, inducement or God knows what kind of word we use in the Balkans about why people change their minds, but some deputies in the parliament in Macedonia must change their minds in order for this to go forward. Once that happens, then it goes to the Greeks. And the Greeks, it's no uh, sure deal that the Greeks will vote the proper way on this. So even though we can celebrate what we see as the right attitude, the right uh, openness towards what will open the door for Macedonian membership in NATO, Macedonian membership in the EU, we are not there yet. No. So we have this good story, potentially. We have the story of wrestling with, Macedo with uh, Kosovo and Serbia, which, again, I do give credit to Taci and, and, and Vucic for at least kicking the discussion into high gear, even though I think the way they're going, they propose to do it would not solve the underlying issues. And then, finally, do not ignore Bosnia. 
because Bosnia, as early as you mentioned this year, I think we did some calculations that by March of 2019, if there is not a new government, if there is not a new budget, you could have cops not being paid. You could have real problems in Republika Srpska. You're, the money that, 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 at least in a halting way, keeps that, that country moving would stop flowing. And then a very expensive cleanup act would be something the Europeans and Americans would have to deal with. Back to you, Frank. Well, there's a lot more Wolfgang to talk about. Um, much of it's contained in the words that we put together in this report. We've tried very hard to face issues, the issue the Russians pose, um, their disruptive policies and tactics and how to manage that. We also have looked at how Europe can be outflanked with Chinese money and investment and the standards under which investment takes place in Europe. The economy is worked undercut by this uh, particular intrusion. There are ideas on all these subjects uh, and that <clears throat> are, are to be found. Uh, but rather than spin this out, I think uh, we ought to turn to all of you and see if what we've said, what you know, your own experience in so many cases leads you to put some questions to us. Frank, could I just Cameron. add, you, you've mentioned Russia, you've mentioned China. One should not ignore Turkey as Turkey, well. Turkey, exactly. Okay, no. so that we have Russia, China, Turkey. When I was ambassador in Serbia, we didn't talk about the Chinese, and the Turks were, in a sense, our friends, working on certain projects together. Um, the Russians were causing problems, and they're still causing problems. Yeah. But, the, but the point is, the notion that the outside world has caught up is big, and we do talk about yeah. it. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you to all, all three of you. I think these are important uh, considerations. Um, I would certainly agree that the, uh, the, the most difficult, the most threatening is the Bosnia case, as, as you put it. <clears throat> I think the, the, the easiest, uh, at least in theory, would be this Macedonian name uh, change issue. That would be, I think, for the first time in, 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 a, in quite a long time, a success story that it is actually possible to move the earth and, yes. um, uh, and, and, to, and to get rid of a problem that has been now blocking this particular country from its aspirations that go both in direction of the EU and, and NATO. But before, and please, we don't have name signs, so if you want to ask a question or make a comment, please introduce yourself. Be kind enough to introduce yourself. Tell us who you are. And uh, also uh, explain whether you ask a question of the entire panel or of one of the uh, members of the panel. Before I open the floor, I, I have already seen Elizabeth uh, Pond's uh, hand go up. Uh, let me, let me offer uh, just one sort of uh, more philosophical remark. Uh, I've been hearing a lot recently uh, from people who uh, were not part of the old, old team, uh, you know, in the 90s on Dayton. You know, what a terrible text is this Dayton Agreement. And I'm hearing... Uh, of course, especially from members of the Trump administration, what a terrible text is the JCPOA on the Iran deal. It doesn't cover Syrian behavior in, uh, uh, I mean, Iranian behavior in Syria. It doesn't cover uh, uh, the question of terrorism. It doesn't <laughs> solve all the problems of the world. What a terrible agreement is that? The observation I want to uh, share with uh, with the all of you here, is that I think in both cases, recently in the JCPOA case and, uh, you know, in the 1990s, uh, in the case of the Dayton Agreement, this was the best text a bunch of negotiators were able to put together with difficult clients yeah. on the other side who were ready to throw in the tile, give up, go home, uh, uh, kill each other, could, uh, you know, at any moment. So, uh, simply to say that it's it's great in theory to think that a much better agreement could have been 
uh, arrived at and how happy we would be if we had not agreed at the Dayton conference that there would be three different military establishments in one country. What a foolish idea. But it seemed to be, at that particular moment, the only way, and, and John remembers it, um, uh, the only way to get the signatures that we needed desperately at that time. So, you know, there's always this difference between the desirable, which is the perfect agreement, and the possible, which is what you can get out of these guys at that particular moment. Diplomacy is um, very often not the choice between the perfect and the bad. It's often a choice between the, you know, the light gray and the medium gray and the dark gray. And the, the question you have to decide is which one is the least bad of three bad options. Wolfgang, you, you put your finger on it. it uh, diplomacy is the art of the possible. In this case, and I'm going to let John, who's thought about this a lot, but Patty Ashdown said something at one point that stuck with me about Dayton, and that is it was a very good agreement and a war, but it was never meant to be an agreement to build a nation. Exactly, yes. And that, I think, is the, the nub of the problem, but go ahead. Sure, sure, I'm happy to say a few words. The, the most interesting thing I have to say on this topic is that if Richard Holbrook were here tonight, he would have agreed with what you said. Uh, that is to say, he, he, he would never tell you that he thought that the end state was the Dayton Agreement as signed. In fact, you know, we worked together on a number of initiatives that he would refer to under the general rubric of Dayton Plus to try and improve the functioning of those institutions. The, the, at, the, at the end of the day, in order for Bosnia to become a member of the European Union, which I really do believe must continue to be its end goal and must ultimately be a place where Bosnia goes in order for Europe to be whole and free, uh, Bosnia's political institutions will have to change. They need to change within the basic framework of the Dayton Compact, which is the notion that these groups will ultimately be, have their, their fundamental rights and interests protected in such a manner through the political institutions that they need not fear the, uh, the things that, the, the, the things that uh, populations feared that resulted in the violence. But uh, that doesn't mean that it has to be exactly as it is right now in the current text. And in fact, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, what we've seen uh, as we sort of look at the dysfunctionality in Bosnia is sort of an exhibit of sort of what can happen if people sort of look for various ways in which they can exploit things in a, in a text to, to bring government to a, to a halt and to a kind of a dysfunctional place. So ultimately, that, that's a, that's a down-the-road problem, but it's not, it's not a tomorrow problem. It is a, to a problem whose time has not yet come, but that will at some point better. need to be resolved. Okay. Elizabeth, you get the first question. Um, thank you very much, all of you, for your commitment. And I suppose your optimism that you can do something. I, I have to say that I, in, in my career of reporting, I have always considered myself an optimist until very recently. <laughs> and, and, and at this point, I just feel like Cassandra every time I write an article. Uh, well, maybe not every time. But um, the, the question is, all of these things are, are so stuck. I, I mean, maybe I'm just asking you a question that you've already answered, because you have described the situation very realistically. But um, do you have any other reason for hope? <laughs> let's collect a few. Uh, let's collect two or three questions, That's and then we go question. back to the panel. Gentleman in uniform. Uh, Heiner Bröckermann. Uh, I'm from Center of Military History and Social Sciences of the Bundeswehr. I spent six months in uh, Bosnia, 96, 97, the rest of I for first uh, S4. And... Uh, in a way, the people I talk to, they tell me the same thing that you told me, that uh, it's uh, no short and no middle time perspective for change. They think one time we will be part of, of Europe, but not uh, 
there's nothing inside. And I want to ask you, uh, what would you propose? I saw you said uh, spending money, a lot of money, in short term to get the, the government uh, going. Is it uh, uh, an idea to, to create an extra plan between European Union and kind of trade union, only between Bosnia and European Union in a way? Or, um, and uh, last question, <laughs> what's with Saudi Arabia? Because when I was there, Saudi Arabia spent a lot of money uh, during the 90s in Bosnia. Uh, okay. okay, will the, the lady in the, in the back there? Yes, please. Okay, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for the discussion. It was really very amazing. Arlet von Kries. I would like to know uh, what do you think about the religion stations, especially in Bosnia, because uh, the financial uh, situation and the problems, they, are, they cannot uh, be seen separated from the religion stations that we have there, especially with the Jews uh, people, Muslim and so on. And how do you think to deal with these tensions without to have negotiations with Russian? Okay. Tom, are you clear about that question? Not quite sure, but maybe I'll okay. We'll take uh, one last question? one from the gentleman here in the third row. I didn't understand. I didn't understand it either. Jürgen Müller. Uh, the Lynn School of Economics. I, I also want to follow the point which my colleague made uh, about what, what carrots can we offer in order to, to guide this long-term process. What, what could be the carrots? You see, because you, you, you paint a picture of a, a stable situa somewhat stable situation where the elites are okay and the rest suffers and goes away. So the question is, what, what sort of carrots can we create either through the EU, etc.? I mean, the proposal of the second proposal, EU negotiations with detailed uh, governance reforms plus carrots might be one, but this needs to be much more detailed and looking very much at what happened in detail at each of the three parties. Okay. I think the question uh, asked by the lady in the back was about religious tensions. What role they played? Religious tensions. Uh, religious, that's the okay. word. Mm -hmm. I'll go, no, go ahead. And, and, that's, and then no, mm -hmm. you, you take... I get optimism. I get optimism. You take well, <laughs> and I'll, I'll take additionality. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, Beth, you, you're right that we're realists, and we were very careful to try to be realistic. But I don't think in that sense we're uh, pessimistic or Cassandras in the sense that, in fact, there are things that are going on in the country uh, that lead us to believe that uh, a systematic or at least concerted effort by governments can make a difference, not necessarily only with governments. And that is the diplomacy that we see, that we don't write about so much here, but that we see under the surface, is the creativity of um, entrepreneurial uh, uh, spirit there, of civic leaders, of some NGOs. You know, we have been going on now for 20 years, since you know, the, the Kosovo War, where a number of organizations have deepened their commitment to the European project and deepen their commitment to kind of uh, comedy among groups there. They're not always visible, and they're often drowned out in the increasingly muzzled press by what you hear from the, uh, the leaders of these different countries. But the point I think we talked about, we gave a couple of suggestions, things like putting together an enterprise fund, which is something that the Americans had done in the past in Central and Eastern Europe. Things like trying to figure out how you get groups together that are not just governmental groups, playing with the strong suit of American uh, and uh, European soft power, to use a corny phrase, but an apt one, that will do the kinds of things that you and I will remember from our time in the 1980s, when it wasn't obvious that things were going to change, at least to those of us who were here in Central and Eastern Europe. But the people we ended up working with were not necessarily the people at the top of the governmental pile. There were people underneath the surface who we can encourage by getting our governments to engage. I hope I'm not being too obtuse about this, but there's a level underneath the level of government of people who really are committed to Europe. And the worst thing we can do is not commit 
and have our governments not commit so that those people don't keep trying to make the links across borders for business, to make the links across borders uh, among universities, among other institutions. I'm hopeful for that because I see in every single one of these countries a lot of pretty smart and pretty decent people who are simply looking for something to hold on to. So part of what we're pushing for is not only the impact of a certain policy that has to do with what the Serbian or what the Kosovar government's going to do, but what that means to the people who live there. Frank used the notion of the brain drain of young people. You have to give them a certain kind of hope that we are engaged with them. That's what makes me hopeful. Yes. Over to you. Go ahead. So, so Bosnia, um, this is what I would say. Um, you know, the, the, the gentleman uh, who suggested that you know, there's this sort of cozy elite set of arrangements that are very difficult, maybe impossible to break through. I think the answer to that is that our approach needs to become a bottom-up approach rather than a top-down approach. We spent many, many years viewing this as a problem that's fundamentally about sort of leaning on leadership. And you know, it may be the case that the change that we're seeking isn't necessarily something that the leadership is eager to have happen unless they're pressured to have it happen by their electorate. And so I think part of the story here has to be that we come up with ways to talk publicly, in some ways over the heads of the leaders who we're dealing with in the negotiating room, yeah. about the opportunities that are available so that the leadership class feels political pressure to say yes to those opportunities. That means, in turn, that we have to come up with ways to describe what those opportunities are other than a sort of an ever-receding event horizon idea that one day people will become members of the EU <laughs> and to concretize that a little bit, you know, it seems to us as we think about it that there are ways that one can break apart what the European, what the Europeanists sometimes refer to as the Aki. And there are certain parts of the Aki that are extremely difficult to uh, ha have uh, um, uh, uh, a country that's in a, in a not fully developed state be become a party to. And those parts are going to be last. Those are the things that come with membership true free movement of persons, uh, participation in the governing institutions of the European Union. Those are the last elements. But there are many other elements that lead up to that, uh, which are you know, very attractive and which uh, uh, we ought to be talking about and working with the parties on as sort of in milestone incentives, effectively. Uh, and the kinds of things we have in mind are, are things like visa liberalization that will allow uh, sort of greater travel, but without the sort of uh, uncontrolled element that the that the full key creates, which um, you know may have you know larger implications for European politics more generally. Uh, we've thought about whether there are ways that we can enhance the economic opportunity of uh, of countries like Bosnia and other countries uh, with, within the region as well uh, by providing greater market access within the EU uh, and, uh, and 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 <coughs> therefore enhancing economic opportunity in ways that are concrete and provide people, again, with a sense that there's real motion and something to play here. So those that play for here. So those are the kinds of things that we're uh, uh, thinking about. We talk about it in a little bit more detail in the paper. Uh, there was also a question about ethnic tensions and sort of how we deal with those uh, issues. They are real and profound. Uh, you cannot go to any country in this region and talk to an ordinary person uh, and not hear you know, just really an astonishing uh, uh, a set of statements about fears, uh, views of other groups within the country. Uh, those are real problems. They are problems, I think, that exist in all societies. We, we've discovered that they exist in the United States as well uh, in, in the last several years uh, in, in a very obvious way. We see them even in highly developed core EU countries. Th those problems are never going to go away entirely. But I think that if we can move the countries of the region further down the curve toward uh, uh, integration within the European Union and continue the many, many uh, efforts that are, have been going on really since the end of the conflicts and the breakup of the former Yugoslavia to encourage dialogue, intercommunity dialogue and cooperation, that you know, one hopes over time that situation will ameliorate itself. But there is no quick fix for that problem. Yes. You know, let me pick up. Uh, the no quick fix argument. Um, Elizabeth, um, I don't think any of the three of us look at the Balkans today, and I bet you no one in this room does, and comes away with a feeling of optimism. But what I'm going to try to leave with you is a thought that you shouldn't be entirely pessimistic either. After all, let's think about where we were and where we are today. Um, 
a war was stopped. Uh, nations have become independent. Wolfgang, you and I involved in emer the emergence of a brand new state that in history had never existed before. In addition, NATO has spread into the region. Um, not in all countries, but it has made a definitive mark on the region. And where it isn't in direct NATO membership like Montenegro, it has indirect relationships with Serbia, for example, and more presumably to come. If you look at uh, the European Union, starting with Thessaloniki and then the Berlin process, you cannot say that Europe made no effort. Uh, the European commitment to this region today as opposed to 10 years ago is just remarkable. Uh, the amount of money spent, the time, the effort to negotiate. So I don't want to just say it's all lost. I do, Elizabeth, however, think that given the issues we tried to highlight for you tonight, that it's going to take something closer to a uh, crisis mode to galvanize political decisions in Bosnia in particular. It just won't work otherwise uh, is because the choices are tough. They're really difficult to make and no one wants to have to use force and enforce decisions, but you will if the conditions become exigent. Cameron, uh, excuse me, uh, John, I think you've largely answered the question uh, that we received from you all as to what carrots and sticks. Please, from our paper and our perspective, remember we tried to approach this not just as things that NATO and the EU ought to give to this region to make it more prone. In fact, be very careful of anyone who comes at you with that argument. For like the drunk, you better be careful you're not handing him another bottle of whiskey. Um, you have to be very careful that you get fundamental changes in governance in return for what you do for the region. And when you get finally to European Union status, that's not the end of the day. It's certainly not the end in Bulgaria and Romania. The job goes on for a long time. So it's an ongoing process. But in the interim, to create that credible path, there are things that we thought you ought to take a good look at. Uh, John, you mentioned several. Circular migration for summer employment, student visa, uh, extended basis possibilities, student access to deal with the young people who have lost hope in their area, the trade understandings to permit a greater flow of goods, a closer integration of supply chains. There are a number of economic measures, currency support um, that can be fitted in, provided that there are clear standards set, in addition to the ECI or the long chapters that have to be written for European Union. We think it's possible to think of, of, uh, of some credible signals to the region that Europe, a European future lies in store. Well, I, I'm, <clears throat> I'm glad we're not um, only sharing sort of negative Cassandra-type um, <laughs> impressions here. And if I might just, uh, we have time for maybe two more questions. If I might just uh, add one observation on the, on the land swap Kosovo problem that you uh, discussed earlier, um, Frank. Look, I mean, in a way, the land swap idea, which I personally... <laughs> Uh, I'm opposed to it for some of the reasons that you uh, explained. But in, a, in fact, the land swap uh, idea is in and of itself a sign of the fact that there is some movement. Ten years ago, it would have been almost inconceivable that uh, Prime Minister Kostunica would have dreamed of recognizing Kosovo in exchange for some territorial arrangements. Uh, the very fact that there is at least now the thought 
in the air that maybe we can have a mutual recognition, maybe with some, uh, from our point of view, unacceptable conditionalities, but maybe, you know, this energy can be driven in a direction that would be, uh, that would be doable uh, and, and useful. So I think there, you know, there is movement, and it's our job to help them uh, channel it in the right, in the right direction towards uh, doable uh, solutions. Again, we have, I think we had a question from the gentleman with the glasses uh, there, and then from uh, uh, my colleague from the foreign ministry. Absolutely. Please. Thank you. I happen to and be then a finally, Richthofen. Okay. Business lawyer in the banking field and public international lawyer uh, initially. Um, two questions only to kind of uh, ask whether or not the strategic level, the geostrategic geostr level shouldn't uh, come into this question because, of course, we are focusing on operational issues, tactical issues with regard to those countries and the populations and the repercussion it may have, whatever policy approach we may have. Uh, I would rather like to address the issue as long as we have a player like Russia has indicated already uh, promoting frozen conflict scenarios all across um, basically their vicinity, down to Libya and Syria and other conflicts, Ukraine, you named it. Perhaps even Bosnia and uh, Serbia falls in the same category. How, how are the prospects of finding any long-term solution in this respect without this big player on the table? And the second would be, what is our actual European interest as the European Union, being amidst the biggest crisis ever, at least as far as I can tell, and uh, not finding, um, coping uh, with interests, va various interests within the European Union, having members like Poland and Hungary not uh, abiding by the core principles, even after having become such a, a successful member of the European Union, to put it that way, and a stable member. How are we going to come to terms if it's not, again, the question, rather to deepen first the European Union before we expand, or should we take, similar to the metaphor of the Trojan horse, potentially future new members, with a stabilizing impact on those members, but potentially a destabilizing one on the European Union? Thanks. Okay. It seems to me that that is more a question we Europeans ought to answer to ourselves rather than ask the Americans. But uh, ah. here you go. But we're just, always happy to offer our position. Yeah. <laughs> we, we do that all the time. We're Americans. So we're just, uh, just to continue, uh, I had the pleasure to talk uh, to, uh, to the Serbian team, let's say, preparing the grounds for EU integration. And it was interesting, the time perspective. And they were, what is it, trained partially and worked in uh, Slovenia and in Croatia. And they said within five years. And for certain reasons, I stood up and said, that's an illusion. Referring to certain difficulties, how to digest and how to sell this argument. They say, we say, okay, to project stability by integration. But at the moment, I think it would be extremely difficult to find what is enough political support to get it materialized. That is the argument, let's say, integration. Mm -hmm. The other one, let's say, somebody asked, what should we do? Plus, when I was in Kosovo, let's say, we had not the possibility to finance the repair of a power station. And they use lignite, and we, in Europe, have certain prejudices towards lignite. But we were not able to get fixed what is a this power station, because we said either or. If you want to get a grant, then we are willing to build a road to Skopje, but we, don't, we are not willing to pay for both projects. I consider that as very, what is it, short-sighted. We should, at least, as far as energy is concerned, we should come forward with far more help. And on the other side, what you said to address the younger people, when I was in Kosovo, totally frustration about visa liberalization. Let's say the status quo under Kosovo is the only one not benefiting from. It is not status quo under. It's worse than ever. And the parents who were able to travel say our kids are not allowed. Mm -hmm. And that is a problem as long as we are not at least giving them. Of course, the security argument you mentioned, I'm very cynical about. The people who try to create difficulties, they find ways. But the other ones who would like to study here without problems, we should give them the opportunity and not being afraid of brain drain. You can, what is it, condition that. Absolutely. Thanks. Last question, Herr uh, von Richthof, here in the front row. First of all, I was ambassador at NATO when uh, Dick Holbrook and Wolfgang Ischinger negotiated Dayton, and I'm most grateful for what they did, because that was the start, and we tried to bring the Dayton Agreement forward, and I'm most... Uh, uh, annoyed that we have not come any further 
in the last uh, 25 years. But uh, I would like to suggest three points. First of all, should we not think of new mechanisms for negotiations? We need to focus more on fra kind of uh, frame uh, conditions or frameworks and focus on security, focus on energy, focus on education, focus on free movement, focus on values. It's maybe an easy, if not it's difficult, but it's maybe an easier job than trying in one or two big meetings to solve these problems which are not solvable. My uh, third point is we need, uh, first of all, what Wolfgang Ischinger did with his book, popularize the foreign and security policy in particular in the Western Balkan and the population. That's where our government is failing, totally failing. And uh, there is now a kind of revolt against this uh, uh, reluctance of the government uh, to uh, discuss these problems that everybody can take place. We had popular figures like Hahn from Volkswagen, like Schwarz Schilling, a former minister under Kohl, who were able to get people behind their efforts. These people are no longer here. They are not, uh, not, not visible. And therefore, if we want to change anything, we must change the top of parties. You see it in Croatia, even a member of the European Union, the young uh, politicians complain a lot that they have no chance in these regimes. So we must give an initiative uh, incentive from the European Union helped by the Americans, we need the transatlantic relationship in this aspect as well to change this, otherwise we will not have the success we want. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you specified changing uh, the top of the parties in the region and not right here, because that could also be... <laughs> 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 Wolfgang, Wolfgang, we're very good at regime change. So. <laughs> Back to the panel. Final words. We have five minutes. Well, and let me uh, take the easiest one, since I have the privilege of coming going first. Um, Russians. Um, I think as I look at the Balkans, as disruptive as the Russians can be and are and will continue to be, um, and I am absolutely convinced there is no deal out there that will make them less disruptive, I am mindful that on this issue, the Balkans, where frankly there are historic ties between the region and, and Russia, um, that there is a way to manage and mitigate, uh, not eliminate Russian interference. Um, the Rus Russians really are determined to be listened to. The future of Europe is Europe's to decide, not Russia's. But at the same time, talking to Russia about what will be the security of the future of Europe, what will be the economics of the future, decisions that lie fully in your own hands. So is the true for the Balkans, that talking to the Russians about what needs to be done and what we are intending to do and go about it, and what we're asking the Balkan states to do, is perfectly reasonable. And it means having a sensible dialogue with Moscow, not conceding anything, but having a reasoned exchange. Now, they will not stop being uh, pests, but let's remember they have very little to back it up with. They have no capital to put in, with the exception of a bit of gas and some old airplanes. They really don't have very much, obviously, apart from Radio Sputnik. So I'm not I'm not worried about competition with Russia. I think we can be smart, but we need to be smart politically. Let me stop there. Good. Cameron. I'll just take a cut at some of this. You know, sometimes you have these problems. You have the best minds in Europe. You have Wolfgang Ischinger and, and uh, Frank Wisner working in 2007 to solve the problem. And the result is that by 2008, my embassy in Belgrade was on fire. You know, we, things don't always turn out the way you expect them to turn out. That said, I think that new approaches, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm stretching the analogy here, but the yes. new approaches are very, very important. Uh, and and uh, to put a plug in for the institute that I now head called the East-West Institute in New York, we are beginning a dialogue on the Balkans uh, just next month that will in fact include the Russians 
and which will also which will also include the topics you're talking about. That is, getting away from merely talking about the existential questions of how countries deal with one another, but what they have in common. You mentioned climate change, you mentioned energy, you mentioned education. Not this typical fare of traditional security discussions, but it, these are becoming the security issues. So I think, I think your idea is one that people are, are working on. Whether we can do this successfully, we're not sure. But, but you're on to the right idea, we think. That's great. Yeah, please. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll take as a last question the, um, the, the, the issue that was raised by one of the gentlemen about deepening versus expansion within the union. I'll exercise an American's prerogative to comment on someone else's political situation. Uh, so uh, it seems to me in a way, that's a very important question, but a question that has, at least to me as an outsider looking in, a rather obvious answer. That is to say... As a realistic matter, uh, the European Union is not likely to expand any further in the near future. Right. In some ways, that's the problem, because the, the leaders in the, the region are many, many things, but they are not stupid, and they absolutely get that joke. Uh, and so the challenge that we all have before us as Americans and Europeans together wrestling with this problem is to come up with ways to keep the parties motivated, uh, recognizing that reality, and not trying to pretend that it it's not so. Uh, and that is, I think, sort of the gravamon of our project, particularly with respect to Bosnia, and, and, and the most important thing that we need to figure out collectively. Okay. Concluding word? Well, just Frank. on behalf of all of us, thank you. Thank you for a marvelous evening and a terrific engagement. Um, this has been one of the highlights of our 18 months of re-involvement in the Western Balkans. And by the way, none of us really intend to fully retire from it. <laughs> uh, but I, I mean what I said at the outset, and that is for all of us in this room and those we talk to outside it, we forget the Western Balkans to our peril. Absolutely. That Europe will not be fully secure until this piece of Europe is better integrated in its security and its economics and its sense of purpose in the future becomes more European. Uh, much has been done. Boy, there's a lot more to do and there are a lot of people coming along to disrupt. But as badly distracted as we all are with world issues, with Brexit, with questions that rage across Europe today, don't forget the Western Balkans to do so. We do at our peril. Thank you very much. As, as we conclude this, uh, this discussion, I, I just want to say one thing, Terry, as, an, as our new president. I think this was a near perfect example of what this academy stands for and will stand for, I'm sure, under your leadership, bringing the smartest minds from the United States on all sorts of different issues to share their thoughts and, and ideas with a very smart audience uh, of Berliners and other uh, uh, Germans, etc. This was a really, a really a good demonstration of what this academy stands for. So thank you to the panel, um, and thank you for your active participation. This concludes our session. I think there are some drinks outside. Great. Thank you. That really was terrific. Thank you.